Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Happy New Year, firstly. I think it's still acceptable to say that. Um, many thanks for joining us today. Um, this is our first webinar series of 2024, um, so thank you for joining us. Um, today we are joined by uh, Leah March, who's the um, Mail Outreach and Crisis Worker for the Solis Centre. Um, and he's going to be kind of providing the SOC awareness training for the Solis Centre and, and how to refer. Um, so, so we welcome you all um, and I'm going to pass over to Liam now. Um, just before I pass over, just to let you know that this session will stretch over an hour. Um, so if you do need to pop out or need to turn your camera, um, need to turn your camera off and just pop out the meeting. Um, we are recording the session, so we will be putting this available on our website. Um, so it, you will be able to see the full session um, after we finish. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Liam. Hi there, guys. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen um, and then I'll uh, introduce myself. Uh, uh, so can everyone uh, see my screen OK? Yeah, fantastic, Liam. Perfect. So uh, the training today is a is SARC awareness training. And my name is Liam March. Uh, as introduced, I am the male outreach crisis worker. Uh, and later on in the training, I'll uh, kind of explain what that means. So uh, throughout the training, there is uh, a trigger warning. There are some videos in, in the training that may be distressing to some. Uh, I will let everyone know before an interview, uh, before um, a video uh, comes on. Um, but this Training is about sexual assault, so uh, I think the whole training may be a little bit distressing, so I do apologise for that. So uh, the training today uh, is, is SARC awareness training, and what we're going to cover in this training is what we do at the SARC, how to refer into the SARC, and what we do once a patient leaves the SARC. Um, so without further ado, let me start by telling you what uh, we do at the SARC. So uh, what uh, the purpose of a, a sexual assault referral centre is to uh, complete a forensic medical examination for a victim of rape and sexual assault. Uh, so rape and sexual assault uh, comes in a lot of different forms, which I'll discuss later on. But the forensic medical involves the taking of forensic samples. Forensic samples are those really long cotton swabs that people tell you to not put in your ears. Um, we use really long ones of those to go into uh, intimate areas to where a sexual assault took place. Um, after the forensic medical has taken place, we will uh, complete the aftercare with the, with the patient. Uh, this is support and guidance, so referrals to sexual health, to counselling, to drugs and alcohol, uh, or wherever that patient may need uh, a referral to. Um, my role as an outreach worker, I work with a lot of different services and organisations within Surrey and national. Uh, to look at um, support for different requirements that people may have. So if people do have a specific need, my staff will come to me and say, do I have a service for this particular need, um, whether it be like uh, learning needs or, or drugs and alcohol, etc. Um, and then we offer medication here at the SARC as well. So we offer um, uh, like LO1, 11 l so it's um, after, uh, so it's like the emergency uh, contraception. Um, that, that uh, females can take. Um, Levin L and L1, they have like different time frames to which you can take them. Um, you get them at uh, a pharmacy, you get them at uh, the hospital, and you also get them here with us. They're, they're free at the SARC. Everything that we offer here at the SARC is free, uh, including the uh, PET, which is the, uh, the HIV exposure medication. It's called post exposure prophylactis, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, that's only licensed up to three days. Um, and that's in case someone has been exposed to HIV, they can come to the SARC um, and after the examination, they will be given the, the PEP. Um, you can also get this from sexual health and you can also get this from uh, A&E as well. Um, I'm not too sure if you can get it uh, just at a pharmacy. I think you've actually, you know, you've got to go uh, to like a, a medical um, agency to get this. So referring into the SARC, uh, is is kind of like the biggest question that we get at the moment, uh, like who can refer in? Uh, there's three kind of types of referrals that we have. It's police referral. Uh, so that's uh, anyone who's been sexually assaulted, they can go to the police 
and the police will then refer them into us. They will manage the whole case for, for the victim where the victim doesn't have to make contact. They'll bring the, the, the patient to us um, and then take them back to their location. Uh, and then we get social care referrals. Social care, uh, they tend to refer into us quite a lot. Um, that's anybody who is either uh, vulnerable, has a social worker or under the ages of 16, uh, will then have a social care uh, referral into us. Uh, or after a section 47, uh, if, it, if they've uh, deemed that a, um, a, a, a SARC medical is needed, then that's when they'll come to us. Or a self-referral. So a self-referral is anybody over the ages of 16 can refer into us with or without police involvement. So if they don't have police involvement uh, in, regarding their case and they just want to come to us and have no police awareness, then uh, they can do so. That's called a self-referral. Um, but that's only over the ages of 16. Um, family and friends can also do this as well, uh, but that would also come under a, a, a self-referral if they're referring their, their, their either their, their daughter, their, their son or their family member to us or their friend into us. Um, but we we'll still need that consent from uh, from the victim. Uh, so that's kind of like what a, a brief summary of what it is that we do at the SARC here, uh, the forensic medical, uh, the samples, because um, we're a victim led service. Uh, it's kind of get the patient in, do what we need to do and then get the patient out. So the forensic medical lasts around four hours is how long we, we tend to uh, allocate. Um, I've known uh, medicals last for about seven hours. I've lasted them. Uh, I've known them to go on for about two hours as well. So it really does uh, vary dependent on the patient and uh, their, their needs and requirements. And then we've discussed uh, we've discussed uh, medication uh, support services and uh, referring in who can refer in. So the staff that we have uh, at the SARC um, on a Monday to Friday nine to five basis is the SARC manager uh, who manages uh, all the policies and procedures and uh, the general managing of the SARC. Really, we have the the nurse, the forensic nurse examiner. So they're not just a nurse; uh, they've probably got a nursing background. They've got a nursing qualification and a pin. Um, but here uh, they do something that other nurses don't, and that's examine the intimate areas on a forensic basis and take intimate swaps, uh, which I'll get into later on today uh, with this training. And then we have the crisis workers. Uh, the crisis workers are there to uh, complete any referrals, uh, discuss the referrals with the patient, so what, what aftercare they might need, uh, and basically be uh, an ear for the patient um, and, and kind of like make them feel comfortable uh, when they come into the SARC, so that's getting them drinks, getting them food and being that ear if they need it. Uh, and if they want to discuss anything with the crisis worker, if they're unsure of anything, then the crisis worker will support them through that as well. Uh, the crisis workers also act as an admin. So again, they will, they will also help with uh, the generic running of the SARC um, and all the day-to-day -day bits that need to be completed, like all the checks and, and whatnot that, uh, that go on here. Uh, and then uh, Surrey SARC are very lucky to have a, a counsellor. Uh, on site um, or up until recently anyway she's just left um, but you don't really see uh, many counsellors on site as a, as a one-stop shop so as soon as they are finished uh, with their SARC medical they can then get registered for uh, counselling um, which is specific to uh, sexual assault and it's like they don't it's like before pre-trial therapy so they don't uh, discuss certain topics around their case they, they discuss like coping mechanisms um, of what had happened and, and how to overcome those feelings until they can actually have that that, that specific counselling around what had happened. Um, not every SARC has a counsellor on site, so Surrey SARC are really lucky to have that. Uh, we're also really lucky to have an ABE suite, so require best evidence or a video recorded interview suite, uh, which the police use very often to uh, manage any uh, well, video recorded interviews that they do um, uh, following a sexual assault. Uh, to get the best evidence and then we have myself uh, i am the male outreach crisis worker but don't let the male bit fool you um, i work with uh, marginalized groups both men and women uh, and and children and those who identify uh, in between male and female as well um, so there's not a single person that i don't really work with i don't feel like anybody should be excluded from uh, the engagement of the SARC. Uh, so i don't just work with professionals i work with victims as well um, not just as a crisis worker, but I go out into like the streets, I hand out leaflets, I go to like freshers, I go to other events in and around Surrey, and I talk to uh, like pedestrians, I talk to uh, the public about sexual assault, and I, I let them know if, if they ever do need to come in to, to us, 
um, we're here for them, no matter where they come from or, the, or their background or, or their gender or sexuality. Um, so that's my role. Uh, but I'll talk about my my male specific role a little bit later on in the training. So how do we help? So how do we help? We help patients who are victims of sexual assault. We don't help perpetrators. Like I said earlier, we're a victim-led service. Uh, so anybody who has experienced um, sexual assault, we are a cradle to coffin service, which means that there are no age restrictions here. So um, I have uh, once been uh, involved in an examination, not in this stock, uh, in, in an examination of an eight week old uh, baby. Um, I've also been involved in an examination of a 97 year old lady. So it really does vary between the ages that we get. So we really do help everyone. Uh, and so how do we help? Uh, so it starts by referring into us. So like I said, the police referring to us, social care referring to us, uh, and this includes strategy meetings, which I know some of you may be social workers, so you may be familiar with these strategy meetings as well as the police. And this is basically a multi-agency meeting where they discuss the needs of the patient. Um, and if there's a sexual assault element, SARC will be involved into that meeting and we'll say if this person qualifies for a forensic medical or if it's just um, a follow-up uh, referral that they need to counselling or, or ISVAs, independent sexual violence advisors, who, um, uh, which is down here actually uh, next to counselling, which um, they support anybody for going for the legal uh, system. Um, so they'll be like their ears and kind of tell them what's going on uh, regarding their case. Uh, and then they'll come to the site, they'll have that forensic medical, that aftercare, any um, medication that they might need, any referrals that will happen. And then they have the counselling that is well. And then we do something called a follow up as well, which um, we follow them up up to six weeks just to make sure that every referral that we've made has reached out to them and they're getting all the care that they need. This could be uh, involved with like, the GP as well. So we, we talk to their GPs quite a bit. Everything that goes on here at the SARC is victim led. So they, they have the choice um, because obviously the choice has been taken away from them regarding their, their, their sexual assault experience. So everything that happens at the SARC, we always run it by the patient first. Is this OK? The next step is this. Do you want this to happen? Um, so that's why it can take so long to for a forensic medical to, to happen, um, because it, we are asking the patient every step of the way. Is this OK? Do you consent for this to happen? Uh, and a lot of it is going through the paperwork uh, when, it's a, when it's a forensic examination. So the follow up is, is up to six weeks uh, and then we check that they're still OK if there's anything else that we can do for them. Um, if not, then we won't contact them again um, until you know they contact us or if, if it's uh, if they want their samples collected by the police. But once they leave our SARC, so when they come in, four hours later they leave we will do something called a forensic clean that isn't just a, a wipe down with with your detail this is a, a, a licensed chemical called cell gene uh, which we use that eradicates dna so if if, uh, if somebody was to touch me i'd wash my hands their dna would still be on me um, if i use this cell gene or chem gene uh, that would eradicate their dna completely so it's, it's used in crime scene cleanups we have that here you can't buy it over the counter. It is a licensed chemical, uh, so you do have a you do need to have a reason to to need it. So that's what we do here. So um, note that we won't pick up uh, any forensics or any DNA from any previous patients that we hear at the SARC, because it will be all, all clean and complete. That forensic clean will take about an hour to about an hour and a half to complete as well. So it's it's not it's not a quick process. Um, so that will be our crisis workers that manage that clean. OK, so who do we help? As discussed earlier um, in the last slide, we help absolutely everybody that is a victim. We don't help perpetrators. Um, that is a different service that, that support perpetrators. We do not uh, engage ourselves in anybody who is a perpetrator unless they are a victim. OK, so if, if they was a perpetrator um, in, in the past and they've recently been sexually assaulted, we will support them on a victim basis with or without police involvement. So everybody that, you know, a lot of people that think that they, after they've been sexually assaulted, that the only way that they can get support is go through the police. That's not actually accurate. They can come to us um, without the police having any knowledge whatsoever. Uh, and there are no age or gender restrictions to coming into our SARC. Like literally anybody can, uh, but it is by appointment only. So every SARC in the country are governed by the FFLM guidelines. 
Now, as you can see here, that is the Faculty of Forensics of Legal Medicine. That are you know, the guidelines of everything that we do here at SARC. Everything that our nurse does is based around these guidelines. The crisis workers need to know them as well, but it's not as important for the crisis worker to know them as it is for the nurse, because it's the nurse at the end of the day that has um, the requirement, the legal requirement to complete these swabs. Um, if she does anything, if they do anything wrong, then they're going to be subject to questioning if that case goes to court and they'll be told to defend their answers uh, and it will all be based around these guidelines. So the most important slide in this training would be this slide here that you're looking at. Because we are dealing with sexual assault, um, if, you, if you come across a patient that has been sexually assaulted, first and foremost is um, knowing when it happened to see if they can come to a SARC to get forensic medical completed and obtain that DNA. These are the time frames in which the DNA can be obtained. So um, I'm going to use the word rape in, in, in this uh, discussion, so I do apologise. But if they've been already raped, so penis to mouth, they've got two days to come into the SARC so we can get DNA. If it's skin contact, so me touching somebody, for an example, uh, they would have two days, up to seven days if they haven't washed. And digital penetration, that means, uh, for example, fingers in the vagina or anus, that's two days. So vaginal rape, that's seven days. It's three days for a child uh, before puberty. Their, their body is, is really good at like pushing out anything that's not meant to be there, both good and bad, because that means it's less time to acquire that DNA from a child. Uh, and penile samples. So, for example, if it, uh, a, a male was made to penetrate, um, you know, uh, quote unquote, uh, the female version of rape to a man, um, then they would have the three days to collect that sample. Uh, or if uh, a male was forced to have sexual intercourse with uh, another person, um, that would still be three days. And then anal rape, obviously male, female, children or adult, is three days as well. So as you can see at the bottom here, forensics are more effective if taken ASAP. The more time passes, the less chance of DNA detected. So if you uh, ascertain that person has been sexually assaulted, get them into the SARC as soon as possible. Um, you know, kind of make sure that they're safe before you bring them in. And then uh, we can sort them out with their mental health uh, afterwards. It's just that we can then freeze their DNA or freeze the samples that, are, that have been taken. So if they come to us without police involvement, they've got two years to then make a decision if, if they wanted to go to the police. We keep the samples here on site. They're frozen uh, in, a, in a freezer uh, that's locked in a locked room in a locked building. So there's no chances of uh, anybody acquiring those, those samples. Uh, and then toxicology. So uh, this is for drug facilitated sexual assault. So if anybody was spiked um, or injected with uh, uh, narcotics, um, then we can take blood samples up to 72 hours and urine samples up to 120 hours. So we do this as standard anyway. If there have been uh, like suspicion of uh, spiking, we would ask if we can take bloods and then pee in a little pot. Um, we'd also keep the tissue that they work with as well. Uh, that would also go to the police. So what is sexual assault and sexual abuse? OK, so the legal definition of rape is when a person intentionally penetrates another person's vagina, anus or mouth with a penis without the other person's consent. This is a statement from the Met Police. So a fun fact is a female cannot rape a man because a female does not have a penis. Um, OK, so this is uh, the legal definition of rape. So uh, if a female was to you know, uh, essentially rape a man, that would be made to penetrate, which doesn't carry as long as a prison sentence as, as uh, male to female rape. So sexual harassment, although it's still legal, it is still sexual abuse. You know, um, yeah, I could go up to somebody in the street and sexually harass them verbally. Um, there was there would be no legal prosecution for that. Um, but it was, you know, you can still report it and uh, I don't think anything legal would happen, but it's, it's on the record then. And uh, if if nobody knows what revenge porn is, uh, it's if somebody uh, distributes a picture to a, a, a boyfriend or girlfriend, that person then sends it around the school uh, or colleagues or, or workforce. Um, that's called revenge porn. If if that if that person distributes uh, an intimate image without the other person's consent, 
uh, normally done in, in it's really common in schools in colleges if um, like a boyfriend or girlfriend are exchanging pictures uh, they break up that that um, that photo then gets distributed so we can't actually do anything at the start for that but it is a crime to do and then stealthing so stealthing is actually something I only learned very recently and stealthing is is, is very common in uh, sex workers um, where they would agree to have sexual intercourse with a, a condom um, and then that person would remove the condom during a sexual act. Um, so they would then be having unprotected sex. That's called stealthing. It's removing the condom without the other person's consent. Uh, and then we have sexual abuse, which is sexual assault over a long period of time. This is really common in um, domestic uh, households. Uh, and then sexual assault, so that's groping, digital touching, uh, digital penetration, um, and again, yeah, so that's stuff like that. And then rape, so that is the non-consensual intercourse of vagina or, or anus. So uh, we've got a no means no here. We do have a uh, video on the next slide. It is about consent. So it's not um, a traumatizing video, um, but if you haven't seen it before, it's, it's a really good uh, video about what consent means. Um, consent isn't just in the forms of sex as well is in the forms of like I think we've all done it as well where we've got like a little baby in the family and we say go and give us a hug and uh, they, they run away and we, we give them a hug anyway you know that's that's still breaking that consent so the video on this slide is about consent it's it about four minutes long with consent can you just hear imagine it imagine instead of initiating yeah it's fine Liam I can hear thank you Ding sex you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea. Thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Then you can make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware that they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important bit, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you're entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say, no, thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, OK? They might say, yes, please. That's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind and you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they are unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea and they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. OK, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea and they said yes, but in the time it took you to boil the kettle or brew the tea and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down, make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they are safe because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it, going, but you wanted tea last week, or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat, going, but you wanted tea last night. If you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you are able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. So that uh, video was um, completed by the Thames Valley Police, and I think it's a really good way of getting consent across to, to children and young people uh, specifically. Um, I've used it uh, with, with my nieces and nephews to talk about what consent means, um, but you can find it on YouTube. So the equipment used in a SARC, 
Now, this is excluding PPE because we would be here all day, but just know that our PPE involves basically no skin um, uncovered. So we use a face mask, hair net, beard net, because I've got a beard, um, goggles, we use uh, overalls, and we use, uh, we have Crocs as well, which is interesting. I see a bunch of people walk around in Crocs all day. So if you are a female, you're going to know all too well what this uh, little instrument here is. This is a speculum. Um, most people will know it from uh, a smear test. Uh, they're horrible things. Uh, interesting fact is that these things were in fact created by a man, if you didn't know. Uh, the man did not like uh, the practice of gynecology when he created this, which is probably why it hurts so much. Um, so these things aren't used on children under the ages of 13 because uh, they are too invasive, they're brutal, um, and you just wouldn't put that near a child. Um, now, everybody will, uh, you know, they can have this inserted into their male or female. This is a proctoscope, and this is for the anal canal. So this is uh, for anybody who's had a, um, an anal sexual assault, or if you need a prostate exam, this is uh, probably going to get used. Again, uh, not used for children under the ages of 13. However, I have seen children's ones of these and it is very sad. They are very small. Um, I don't think they should exist, but they, they do exist. It's very sad to see. Uh, and those big long cotton swabs, which uh, I said, to, you know, we, we were told not to put in our ear. These are the ones that we use at the SARC. They're very long and uh, they're, they're used so they can go through the, um, the speculum and the proctoscope. Um, again, not used internally uh, for children under the ages of 13. They're just not externally. So if, if a child, uh, a young person under the ages of 13 come into the SARC, uh, it would just be on the outside of the genitalia as opposed to uh, being inserted into a vagina. It would just be on, on, the, on the outer walls uh, of the child's vagina. Um, and then a colposcope. Uh, some officers may already know what this is. Um, these are used to take pictures and images uh, and, and uh, video recorded uh, images. Um, we use these all the time on children, um, without a doubt, without question. These are being used for everybody's safety. Um, adults have the uh, the ability to consent if one of these are used uh, or not um, for videos or uh, um, images. Uh, however, we tend to just use it for the uh, the light anyway. So these are cameras essentially that can record uh, and take images up to 200% of what like an iPhone can do. So if you get your iPhone out, you go on the camera, you zoom all the way in, it's going to be pretty blurry. This thing will zoom in 200% times more than that will and still have a very clear image. These are then burnt onto discs or were burnt onto discs that we kept at the SARC. They're now, uh, they're now on uh, online um, on a very, very secure server, which I think you know, would be very hard to break into that. And then um, a lot of people get uh, a bit befuddled and a bit scared of what a forensic examination room looks like. Um, so I decided to put a, a picture of one up. It kind of looks like a, a, a doctor's surgery um, room uh, or, or a dentist room. They're just very clinical white rooms, very minimalistic. And uh, we've got a chair in there for any patient that wants to bring a chaperone or if uh, if we have a child in, they can bring um, a parent or guardian or, or a social worker. OK, so uh, in this slide, we're going to talk about signs of sexual abuse. Now, this list is not exhausted. And just because you see one of these signs, it doesn't mean that the person that you know is in question is being sexually abused. It's when you start putting multiple of these together, it might be time to have a conversation with somebody or have a conversation with the person that's expected to be been abused. So uh, unexplained pregnancy, STIs and STDs. Uh, Over-sexualised behaviour, this is uh, common in children as well, but, you know, over-sexualised behaviour in an adult doesn't always necessarily mean they've been sexually assaulted, they might just have a higher sex drive. Absence from work or, sex or, or education, unexplained uh, marks, bruises, cuts on the body, afraid and avoids a specific person, this could either be at school, college or work, or, or a family member. 
and changes in emotion, persona or mental health. So it's, I think it's important uh, with this one, you know, if they've got anything going on at home or if they are being sexually abused. And then these ones are the ones in children as well. So you could look at all the others from the last page. Uh, some of these can be included with adults as well. So uh, if, if a child has started uh, using drugs or alcohol, uh, are they being um, exploited or abused? Um, the lack of peer relationship. So they're avoiding somebody um, and they don't, they don't want to make friends for a certain reason. Refusing to change in PE or participate in uh, physical activities. Uh, this could be like uh, something that is down to their um, you know, them being shy or not. Uh, and then changes in eating habits as well. Are they trying to control their eating because they've lost controlling something else? Having received unexplained gifts or items. So again, very common in uh, exploitation in children and in vulnerable people, not just children. Um, bedwetting, we see a lot um, in, in children that have been sexually abused. It's a way of um, kind of keeping like predators away at night time. And then run away from home or care. They're trying to run to somebody, or trying to run away from somebody in, in their care and displays uh, inappropriate amount of knowledge around sex for their age. So it's, it's very natural for a child to kind of find themselves um, when they're young because they, they try, they, 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 they do something with their bits and pieces that may feel nice. They don't actually know what it means. But as they get older, are they kind of explaining to an adult or another person what a, a, a sex act is? Are they of the age of where they're watching porn or are they actually, you know, has something happened to them or have they seen something that they shouldn't have before their age? Um, a, a sad one that we get in uh, is, you know, a parent or guardian or the school would notice that a child is, you know, showing difficulty walking or sitting. Um, you know, is this because they're injured or if they've got like a, a sexual injury or if, if their vagina or anus hurts or if their penis are hurting from something that's happening and uh, sleep disturbance or nightmares is another sign. So, again, just because you see one or two of these in, in, in a child or, or, or young person or, or an adult doesn't necessarily mean they're being sexually abused. I mean, difficulty walking or sitting, I would probably question if they've hurt themselves or if someone's hurt them. Um, but you, you look at more than one of these and it, again, it might be time to ask some questions. So um, the pathway for an adult is basically they get referred in by a friend or family, uh, they have an examination and then they have their referrals and ask care and leave. It's not too different for a child. So, however, with a child, it's only police and social care that can refer them in. If a, if a parent refers them in, we're going to make police and social care aware. Um, that's just how it is. Anybody under the ages of 16 is going to have a, a social care referral. Evidently, the social care may or may not report to the police. Um, and some of you may be social carers as, as well. So if, if you do have a, a, a child that's sexually assaulted, it's important to bring them to the SARC uh, or arrange a strategy meeting uh, and or call the police, uh, which it will then get arranged. So when they come into the SARC, if you haven't already been, we uh, we have two different services. We have a, a two, uh, we have a 13 plus service, which is uh, a people that I will see, 13 plus. And then we have a paediatric service as well uh, for non-acute. Uh, we do have a cute, which will be seen by another doctor here at the SARC. It's a, pretty, it's a confusing little contract that we've got here. But the under 13s non-acute, uh, we have a specific child uh, crisis worker uh, that when they come in, the, the crisis worker will get to know the child through play. We have a, a very nice little playroom here with a little interactive TV, loads of toys, cuddly toys, plushies, sofas, um, kind of gender neutral toys as well, where the child can just play. Um, and they will create a calm, relaxed atmosphere and environment for that child. Um, and I've been told that I need to put this in as well, that the uh, medical examination is child led, depending on their age uh, and what samples can be taken. The child medical for uh, an under 13 is very non-invasive. So I need to get that clear that um, the child medical may take 25 minutes, but the examination on the intimate area will only take minutes if that this is very quick and nothing is inserted into a child either unless it's absolutely necessary um but it's very non-invasive as sad as it is a child is sad to leave in this place than it is for them when they are when they come in because of all the toys and oh my goodness do we feed them little children up we give them chocolate we give them drinks every now and then depending on their age we give them a can of coca-cola um but yeah we fatten these little kiddies up when they come in, we give them all the toys, we give them all the attention that they could ever want. So they're kind of sad to leave in because they've got to leave all of that behind. 
Um, if the child is really young, they may not actually know that coming to um, a place like this is, is scary. Um, it's just uh, when they get a little bit older, then they might get a little bit scared. Um, but if you take a picture, uh, I think you're going to get these slides actually at the end of this, but we have a, a child step by step guide um, for children specifically uh, 13 and under. Um, so it's, it's worth looking at that if, you, if you're interested in a video. I would have incorporated it into this one, but I think it's long enough as it is because uh, it's sort of like a 25 minute video on a, on a child sark. So it's, it's a very good watch if you've got that time to spare. I know you guys are mad busy, so you might not have, but if you do, in your own time, maybe. So um, sexual abuse and the barriers that present across different ages. So basically, this is uh, why some people may not um, disclose their abuse. And more often than not, it's they're scared of the abuser. Uh, it's a coping mechanism. Uh, it's like Stockholm Syndrome. So I've seen it before. I worked in a children's home where a 13-year-old girl had fallen in love with her foster brother who had been raping her uh, literally on a, on a daily basis. Um, but the, the perpetrator made the child uh, fall in love with him. So it was kind of like perceived as love, not, not sexual abuse. Um, and then level of maturity as well. So this person may think like have dating a 17 year old person when they're 13 is really cool. Um, in actual fact, it's, it's, it's rape um, if they've had sex. Um, but they might think it's really cool. It's really like it's edgy and awesome. But it's not. That person just doesn't know what is actually going on. So, yeah, these are just um, some barriers that they may face when when um, when they may not report. So FGM. So although we can't although we can't see or do anything regarding FGM at the SARC because it's not anything that we can do with, with sexual assault, and this is something completely different. This is female genital mutilation. And although this video is going to portray four different types, there is a fifth, which is called breast ironing. That's just wrapping the breasts up so they don't grow and develop, um, making a female less attractive to a man, uh, apparently. Um, some of you may know more uh, in this than I do, which um, I do not claim to be an expert in FGM at all. Uh, I just think it's very important for uh, myself to know about, and uh, I like to teach everybody else about FGM as much as I can. Uh, what I will say is if we do see a victim of FGM in our SARC uh, that have been sexually assaulted, um, what we do, we make police and social care aware if, if they have anybody uh, below the ages of 18. Uh, so if they have children, um, so if, say for example, we get a, an adult female in who has experienced FGM. Um, if they've got children under the ages of 18, then we will uh, make a report to social care. Uh, and I think our nurses now have a register that they need to report to. Um, is everyone happy to watch this video or should I skip it? I'll, um, I'll play it. Yeah, play it. My name is Comfort, Comfort Momo, and I run a support service for women and girls who've been through female genital mutilation, FGM. When they come to the clinic, they are so frustrated, they are so upset that this has happened to them, in the sense that this was done by their family. There are four main types of female genital mutilation. The first type is when the clitoris, which is the top part of the private part, has been removed completely or half. When again, the clitoris has been removed and then the inner lips, which is also known as labia minora. Where the clitoris has been removed, the inner lips, and then they remove the big lips as well. And when they remove everything, the edges are stitched together, leaving a tiny opening for the passage of menstrual flow as well as urine. Type 4 is also known as unclassified, which include pricking the clitoris, sometimes introduction of corrosive materials to the vulva area, or tattoo, cutting into the flesh or the rugae or the floor of the vagina. The immediate complications include hemorrhage, excessive bleeding. When you remove the clitoris, 
either with scissors or with razor blade, the child or the young woman will bleed. Women who've had female genital mutilation present with recurrent urinary tract infection, vaginal infection, and this can prevent women from getting pregnant because this will lead to infertility. Other complications include HIV because of using the same razor blade or the same equipment for girls. Pain during sexual intercourse, pain when having your period. If they have had type 3 female genital mutilation, we have to cut them open again because with a small tiny opening, there's no way they can have normal penetration during sexual intercourse, a child can die from the short-term effect of female genital mutilation. A mother can die during childbirth. A baby can die because of asphyxiation. FGM can kill. We need to change attitude. We need to empower women and girls. We need to end FGM now. Uh, so I, th I think that's very important for everybody to know about FGM. Uh, interesting fact again, uh, it happens here in the UK. The most common places are West Midlands and I think Slough in Thames Valley uh, are the most common places. I've seen this video a hundred times and every time I see it, I cross my legs with the pain that this happens because I can't imagine anything worse than, than doing something down there, uh, especially to a pair of scissors. Um, so it's very important that this this is known about and kind of like awareness is out there. So um, yeah, if you don't know about FGM, you do now. If you want to know more about it, just Google it um, and you can find out more. OK, so this is uh, essentially my bread and butter. This is my job title, male outreach crisis worker. Uh, and here's what I'm going to talk about uh, supporting marginalised groups. Um, who have experienced sexual assault. So um, because it is my role, I do need to mention that it is male sexual assault support. Um, that's MSAS, M-S-A-S, -S, male sexual assault support. Um, so I'm a male outreach crisis worker. There are three of us. Um, one in Sussex, one in Surrey, and one in Kent. Um, so there is one more video I'm going to play you. That is it for the rest of the training but it is uh, the most important video in this training. Um, so Male uh, Sexual Assault Support, MSAS, is a male-specific project set out uh, for males who have uh, suffered sexual uh, trauma, uh, both either recently or uh, historically. Um, and it's set out for men and made by men. So myself and my colleagues have put this uh, project together um, to support males and marginalised groups who have experienced sexual assault. So, um, there are some stats and statistics um, around why uh, we are put in post and why males uh, and marginalised groups may not come forward, which I'll talk about after the video. This video I know is distressing um, and it, it talks about male sexual assault in, in quite a, a good amount of detail. So I ask if you don't want to, you know, if you do find yourself uh, easily upset, then please do uh, mute your computers now because uh, I'm about to press play. But I assure you this is only a three minute long video um, and it, it can be quite distressing. We're going to unpick this afterwards. I was sexually abused when I was about eight by an older male cousin. I've been sexually assaulted on four different occasions. I was six years old the first time that I was molested. A neighbor named Hank took me into his house. And at first it was hugging, and then his hands traveled. And when I tried to push him away, he beat me. And then he raped me. And I was haunted by the fact that this happened in a little girl's bedroom. For a long time, I blamed myself. I was just angry because I'd go to school and nobody in school knew what was going on. When I tried to tell my mom, she kicked me out of the house and laughed at me and told me I would never deserve anything better. It became something that lasted until I was 17 years old. 
I remember after it happened and after he left, sitting on a bed for a while, torn up and saying, I am never going to tell another living person about this. I went and got my friends and I drove them home. Thank you for reading that, Katrina. Thanks. Now, if you had the chance, how would you respond to this person's story? I just feel like, or just like, hug her. <laughs> um, and just let, you know, let her know it's not her fault. You were a little girl, and it's not your fault, honey. You actually have the chance to meet that person because they're here today. This is James Metters. This is Mark Godoy Jr. This is Isaac Andrade. This is Walter Castaneda. This is Glenn Hall. He served in the Army for 30 years, retiring as Command Sergeant Major. And what you just read is his story. What you just read was his story. Oh my God. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing good. Thank you for reading my story. I know the statistic is one in six. I'll go into a room and I count six men. I'm like there's somebody else in here. Yeah. And they're probably dealing with it the same way I've dealt with it, which is not talking about it. To share the same experience, um, I was young and I was in college. I was uh, sexually abused. You know, we don't talk about these things, but it happens, you know. I grew up in a Latino household. Where I know what that's like. <laughs> my dad telling me, no llores, cabrón. No eres vieja, you're not a, a girl, don't cry. And on the other side, you're getting abused and you don't know what to say. I joined the army to die. I was abused from the time I was born till I was 17. Masculinity made me put away what I was feeling and not really deeply feel what had happened to me and recognize and acknowledge what happened to me. Getting suspended in the fourth grade, getting in a fight, getting expelled from one high school, it's all part of the abuse. And it's all part of me and the child, my inner child acting out and starving for attention. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I rose in the rank of the military, they like tough guys, but inside I was dying still makes me emotional. <sighs> that what happened to me wasn't because of who I am. It was something that was done to me. Um, it's not me. I know a lot of males are too afraid to speak up, but I'm real open because I want to inspire the male yeah. survivors. That not just males with disabilities, but also males without disabilities. Yeah. Identify myself as a black gay survivor. I had a lot of fear, and I just posted a link on Facebook saying, this is my story. If you want to read it, you can read it. And the response I got after that was uh, nothing but kind. Every time I share my story, um, especially as a man, I, I always hear back, hey, can I talk to you? Yeah, what's up? This happened to me, too. This happened to me, too. This happened to me, too. I'm not doing this just for myself. It's for many others who voices not been heard before. It's really hard not to cry. <laughs> um, I'm really glad you've done the work and I know that you changed somebody's life. So that's all I can say without crying. <laughs> you can survive it, you can get through it. I think you're just so strong. <laughs> like, I don't know if you know it, but you're, you're very strong. Thank you. It just makes you remember. So uh, this is a video by one in six in the USA. Um, however, the, it's the same stat uh, over here in the, in the UK. Uh, so on a scale that uh, America is to, to England and uh, Wales, it's, it's enormous. America is absolutely huge. Um, it's got to be like 15 times the size of what England is. And it's the same stat. It's one in six males 
will have experienced some form of sexual assault or, and violence in in their life um, in England and Wales, as it is in America on a much larger scale. So that stat, I mean, I tell it every time I do this training and it still blows my mind. I still don't understand it. Uh, so I just want to check in after that video because I know it can be quite emotional. Um, I've seen it a good handful of times and it still gives me the odd goosebumps here and there. So um, is everyone OK to carry on? I'll um, probably take that as a yes. I'm sorry if, if it has affected anybody. Um, so moving on, uh, we do, I, I want to look at some of the assumptions that were made in the video. So they've automatically assumed that the, that when they were reading out the statement, say it was a female that was uh, that was a victim, I would give her a hug. You were just a little girl. Uh, I would let her know that it's not her fault. These are just some of the the quotes that were made by um, the people reading out the the statements of of what happened. Um, so people have made these assumptions because of the, the stereotype that it's men who sexually assault females um, and it's not people, it's not men that sexually assaulted. And some myths and some uh, assumptions that are actually in reality. And these are myths um, because they've been debunked that men cannot be raped. A man can be raped, but it is by another man. Not only gay men are sexually assaulted, that's wrong. Um, straight men can be sexually assaulted as well. LGBT men uh, can be sexually assaulted. Anybody can be sexually assaulted or raped. Um, only gay men sexually assault other men. Straight men can sexually assault and rape other men. Um, uh, it, you know, this is done either out of power, out of hate crime. There's many different reasons why men or people may sexually assault people. Uh, victims go on to be perpetrators. It's actually said that most uh, victims of sexual assault go on to support victims of sexual assault. Um, it is the the, the minority of, of the few victims that go on to be perpetrators. Um, their reason is because it happened to them and it's just normal for them. Um, and then men cannot be victims of sexual assault. Well, after that video, I think we've just established that men absolutely can be victims of sexual assault. So looking at speaking up and reporting, now you can see 15 to 20 years on your screen. If we just take a second to think of what we're going to be doing in 15 to 20 years, are we going to be retired? Are our kids going to grow up? They're going to have, a, have an amazing job. Are we going to have a house? Are we going to pay it off? Um, what pet are we going to have? 15 to 20 years is a very huge amount of time. It is an enormous length of time, 15 to 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I was still in school um, and, um, and now I'm here and I'm teaching consent uh, and psych awareness. So uh, a, lot, a lot has happened in, in 15 to 20 years. 15 to 20 years is, is, is on average how long it takes for a man to speak up about sexual assault, at which point a man is in crisis. So a man has a social expectation to be a man. We have that patriarchy, don't we? We have that masculinity. Like in the video, that man said, uh, masculinity made me put away what I was feeling because we're told that if we cry, we're, we're being a pussy. Men don't cry. We're, we're called a, a girl because women are perceived as weep, weak for some reason. Um, so that's apparently an insult. Uh, the older generation might recognise big girls' blouse. I'm not too sure what that means, but I think it's just another term for calling somebody uh, emasculine, uh, feminine. Uh, and because we're men, we're supposed to be tough. Um, and this is this is this is the same in different cultures and ethnic groups that men have to be strong, aggressive, bold and confident. Um, we're perceived as big, strong people, aren't we, that we can handle anything, that we don't cry over strong uh, emotionally and physically when this isn't actually true. We shouldn't be uh, afraid to have that, you know, uh, if, if it's the right terminology, but we should not be afraid to have that feminine side. Um, like I myself, I do my hair. I take pride in that. I, I've been known to paint my nails, clear coat, not colour. Um, so it's OK to have that little bit of femininity. It's OK to have a lot of femininity. It's OK to be gay. It's OK to be straight. And just because we have a, a, a willy between our legs doesn't mean that we have to be, you know, the, the depiction of a man. We can be whoever we want. And we're told through our parents, through our, our grandparents that, we need to be strong, otherwise we're told that we're not a man, we're not good enough. Uh, so here are some statistics. So one in six males will have experienced some form of sexual violence or assault in their life. The male suicide rate is 15.8 per 100,000 compared to female suicide rate. So 
we're looking at over 10 percent more men are committing suicide and these males are aged 50 to 54 to have the highest suicide rate now that is a huge amount of number uh, it's a huge number sorry and it just correlates between 15 to 20 years um because by the time that a man seeks help it's relatively too late because they can't get the help in time um here at the sark if a man has experienced sexual assault in their childhood or 10 to 15 years ago however long ago it was we can support them as well as uh, um uh, people that don't uh, just identify as a male, people who identify as other groups as well, we have support for them. So non-binary um, and uh, transgender people too, we can also support. So here are some uh, statistics uh, for the LGBT. I do apologise. Um, I won't read these out. I'm sure you guys can read. Uh, but these are the stats from Gallup, which is a national uh, support agency um, in the UK that support um, uh, members of the LGBT community, they recently re recently released some stats around sexual assault. Um, but what I will read out are the facts at the bottom here, because these are quite interesting. So LGBT plus people are at higher risk of suicide due to the way that they're treated, not because of their mental health. So uh, because uh, they're still not seen as, as human beings uh, or sane human beings, because some have um, uh, gender dysphoria, so they, uh, some people are, uh, identify as, as male when they're female, vice versa. Um, this is often perceived in, in, in our society that it's, it's not okay, um, so then we treat them uh, badly and then they can go on to have uh, increased mental health, suicide ideations. So conversion therapy, uh, if you don't know what conversion therapy is, it's basically, uh, from my understanding, is it's a way of converting people who are gay uh, to to see the light almost, just to to get them straight, to make them straight. So conversion therapy is, is still legal and it's still practiced here in the UK, um, and it's just not okay. Um, I'm not too sure why it's still practiced. I don't think you'll find people that do practice it, but it's still legal to practice it. And pride. Personal rights in defence uh, and edu pers personal rights in defence and education. That's what Pride stands for. I only found this out a few weeks ago. I didn't know. Did you? So it's more statistics. Uh, I do apologise. So for rape or sexual assault by penetration, there were no significant differences between ethnic groups or across ethnic. Uh, ethnicity for men and uh, women. However, for indecent exposure or unwanted sexual assault. Uh, and sexual touch and those in mixed ethnic groups were significantly more likely to be victims than those who are in white and Asian and other ethnic groups. This was taken from the National Office of Statistics uh, for England and Wales. This I thought this was quite interesting. Um, it doesn't really teach you much, it's just a little stat um, for um, black and Asian minority ethnicity groups. Um, so how do we help? So are we are we aiming to break the barriers by working in partnerships and uh, with other uh, uh, services and organisations and charities? Um, male services uh, and LGBT services are very few and far between. Um, so to find services that specifically support victims of sexual assault in marginalised groups is very difficult. So we don't just work in our local area um, in Surrey. We work across the whole of the UK, working with organisations who deal uh, with the support for men and marginalised groups, so BAME and LGBT people. Uh, so uh, in, in doing that, we are changing the way that uh, sexual assault is seen by people. Uh, so I teach consent. I go into colleges, I go into schools, I go into universities to talk about my work and to show people the uh, tears consent video I talk I also talk about uh, with with the public how sexual assault may uh, be perceived by the uh, by the victim and how they would feel if it was like their loved one that was being sexually assaulted uh, just to try and change that that view of it as well um, I like to work on the preventative side as opposed to the fixing side of things um, I you know I always say to people that this is one job that I would happily take redundancy for should it mean that there's no more sexual assault so we work on changing the way that sexual assault is seen by people and we tackle the stigma and myths and assumptions around uh, sexual assault so we've talked about the, the stigmas and myths of, of, of males 
but we we look at the stigmas and myths of females that um, if if a, if a female wears a low cut top or a short skirt and they get sexually assaulted, that the assumption is that they must have been asking for it because um, they were you know men can't control themselves that they need to release that sexual um, that feeling uh, and then we take it out on a, on a female that is wearing a short skirt or, or or low cut top this is not the case like uh, women should be able to walk around in whatever they want um, and not have to worry about being sexually assaulted um, but people even females will, will say to another female that you know you shouldn't be wearing what you was wearing uh, so he's kind of asking for it <clears throat> you, you, you're not asking for it you, you should be able to you should be able to wear what you want and working with marginalised groups as well. So I don't feel like um, it should just be men and women that are able to access our, our support. It should be people who um, are in the LGBT community who are uh, people of colour, uh, so a black and Asian minority ethnicity people. So we work with um, uh, Bain Council in Surrey, uh, Sussex and uh, Kent. Uh, we work with LGBT services in, in these three counties as well as national as well, because like I said, they're very few and far between. So when you can find them, you, you, you get a lot of work done. Uh, and then again, working with like uni, universities and schools and colleges as well to get that point across that uh, people that are from different groups and backgrounds have a place to go. Um, if they have been sexually assaulted uh, and ensuring people that are aware of our service so for first and foremost that we need to ensure that people that we need to ensure people know that they have somewhere to go should they be sexually assaulted um, doesn't matter where you're from doesn't matter who you are your sexual background your sex your ethnicity there is always a place here if you are a victim of sexual assault and I've got some, uh, some little uh, numbers here as well so one in six men uh, one in ten children will fall victim of sexual assault and um, when I when I completed this uh, this training here, it was one in three females. It's now changed to one in two females, which is a staggering number because these are just the reported stats. So if you look at the unreported, you're looking at some form uh, of sexual harassment, sexual assault, or indecent sexual behaviour. We'll have experience. Uh, every woman will have experience at some point in their life, whether it be walking home from school and their cat called by a builder. Um, they will have experienced some form of, of, of sexual harassment or unwanted sexual attention by somebody at some point in their life. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, if it hasn't happened to you, you're very lucky. But I'm pretty sure that every female in this country will have experienced some form of that in their life. OK, so we are coming to the end of the training now. Uh, sorry it's taken so long. Um, I feel like we've covered quite a lot in this in this session. So the site process and what it is we do, referrals coming in and referrals going out. Uh, we've talked about consent. We've talked about FGM, the forensic window. So uh, you are going to get these slides. This is the window that I would ask that everyone uh, takes from this training um, is, is understanding what those forensic windows are and how to get them to the SARC uh, in, in that time frame. I understand what sexual assault is in, in adults and children, difference between marginalised groups, i.e. men and women, uh, and common signs of sexual assault in children and adults. So um, these are just uh, some of the feedback that we've got. These are from mixed gender feed, uh, these are from mixed genders. Uh, so the stuff are lovely and friendly, you can read it. Um, but we ask everybody who comes to our service uh, to fill out feedback um, just so we can uh, develop our service a little bit better. Um, so if you have any questions, now is your time to shine. There is no such thing as a silly question. If you want to know something, I will try and answer it for you. And these are our details. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, come on to uh, Teams now. Thank you, go. Liam. Uh, the Q&A bar is open, so if you want to pop a question, I've just seen uh, Tara's just popped in. Not a question, but just to say thank, fantastic and informative session. Thanks so much. So some feedback for you there, Liam. Cheers, um, I appreciate that. Are there any other questions or if people want I can open up the chat bar if it's easier or if you'd like me to open up mics and cameras I can open up the the option to do that as well yeah if you open up the chat bar I'll let people like yeah might feel more no comfortable in, in typing in their, their questions as opposed to asking them on mic which is it's fine I get it and uh, I must uh, apologize as well for waffling on everybody there was a lot to cover in a short amount of time I think we've just gone over an hour this normally takes me about an hour and a half to complete but I've had to kind of like go for it and I do apologise, it's been a bit um, a bit numb. 
but uh, for everyone to sit and listen to uh, my little boring voice. So yeah, feel free to ask questions. Um, failing that, my info uh, is is on the training that you'll get sent out. So you can always email me questions uh, as well. Or if you uh, if you want to refer in, you you always can do that as well. But yeah, um, I'll hang about for a bit if anyone wants to stay and ask ask questions. Thanks, Liam. Um, just for all of the attendees, we've just opened up the chat bar so you can pop in the questions if you want now. Um, so, oh, they're all popping in now. Uh, okay, so, so we've got one here. Um, do we refer by email? No, so you can call up and refer. Um, it's the best way. You'll go through to our call centre. They will take some details, put you through to a, a nurse who will then take uh, a bunch of questions and get an examination booked in. So I'd always recommend calling in. A uh, number is found uh, on the uh, training that you'll get sent, uh, or you can just look us up. How do you look after yourself? Uh, so we have clinical supervisions um, to look after ourselves and we debrief after a, after a case as well. So if we do get a, a particular case in that we do find difficult, uh, I myself have had uh, several of these. I tend to talk with the staff on shift and then I, I, I jump on a, a clinical supervision as well just to talk about it and see what I could have done better. Um, and we also get counselling as well provided if um, if it's pretty tough and, uh, and we find it a bit hard to get over it. It can be a pretty painful job. But I think yeah, jobs like this kind of have a shelf life. Um, any other questions? Let's go down. OK, I don't really, I don't think I see any other questions here. Uh, what's this? So if someone has been assaulted years ago, how would you go through the process knowing forensics may not be possible? OK, so forensics definitely aren't possible. Anything over, you know, seven days uh is, is not possible to obtain forensics but what we can do in this point is um you can still report it to the police um i don't think it's going to go anywhere but it will be on that person's file uh, we do have services here um should uh, that person need support we use uh, a lot of like uh services like uh, like i don't know if you've heard of aurora foundation we would make a referral into them um and then they would manage your care as well. So uh, specific services who support victims who were sexually assaulted in childhood or a few years back. Um, there's like many different services that we use for people that have uh, experienced some form of sexual assault in their life. OK, uh, once you have seen the victim, do you inform the GP, etc. of what? So we only inform the GP if the patient consents to a GP referral being done. So we don't tell anybody about um, their involvement with the SARC unless they consent to that, unless they are, of course, a safeguarding risk to themselves or other people. Um, we, we have to ask them everything uh, where they want their information to go. Yeah, if safeguarding agencies are involved, then you would find out uh, if that person uh, is is under your care. Um, but if that person doesn't have a safeguarding risk, then we won't refer them. If, uh, say, for example, um, they had a social worker, we would let the social worker know. Um, if that person had children in the home uh, while they were sexually assaulted, then we would let safeguarding know. Um, or if that person had um, uh, intentions to end their life or to hurt anybody else, then we would let somebody else know. Uh, the police will investigate allegations, even if non-recent, Paddy. OK, there you go. The police will investigate the allegations, even if it's non-recent. So I appreciate that comment, actually, because I didn't know. I just uh, I just assumed that they would do like a little, little search and maybe add it to the person's file. But yeah, if, if they do their own investigation, that's that's great. There's just a question, Liam, in the Q&A bar. Um, do you have or use any easy read documents? Um, yeah, we uh, we use a lot of easy. Re I can probably put some in the chat, or I can email you some if if if, if you need it. Um, but at the, here at the start, if if we're ever unsure of anything, then uh, we have a lot of easy read guides set up by the company. If we're unsure of anything, a lot of it is from the FFLM guidelines. If I'm honest with you, but yeah. That's it. Well, I think that's all of the questions. Um, we will uh, put a feedback 
survey and a link in the in the chat bar after this session is finished. So if you could just give some feedback for Liam, I know there's a load of comments that there in the chat bar for Liam. So really appreciate all of the feedback already. Um, but we'll pop that in the in the chat so that you could just uh, complete that. That'll be really helpful. Um, so thank you again, Liam. Really, really informative session and it was very insightful to understand. Um, about the SARC awareness training and obviously how to refer and all the different types of uh, sexual assaults that are there. Um, and it's, it's, it's really insightful, so thank you. Um, all of our attendees, this session will be made available on our website, so you can find that on the SSAB website, um, along with Liam's presentation. Um, so that I'll get that uploaded as soon as possible. Um, our next webinar, so we uh, as part of our communication and engagement with uh, with the board, we are rolling out a series of webinars. So we've got our next webinar, which is being held in March, um, and that's around preventing the abuse of older people, and that will be hosted by Hourglass. So I'll pop in the link for that if you would like to register for that. Um, but full details can be found on our website as well um, on our on our webinar page. So. Um, feel free to check that out. And I think I'm just going to hand back over to Liam. He's got one more thing to say. Hi guys, uh, so before uh, before we all uh, dip out, I just want to say that uh, as a SARC, we do hold open days here as well. So if you do want to find out more, please uh, give me an email. We will get you booked into an open day. You can come to the SARC and see uh, what uh, you can. You can talk to a nurse, you can talk to another crisis worker, you'll get to see the paediatric suite and you'll get a view around the SARC, including the video recorded interview suite, which we use. Please do send me an email if you're interested in this. I think a lot of people find it useful. You also get a goodie bag as well. I say a goodie bag, you don't get sweets and a cake like you did as a child to a party but our goodie bags are basically safety items that i would normally bring to events uh, and we have a lot of uh, services and leaflets that we uh, we would put in the bag for you to use should you find yourself using them at some point for a patient or yourselves or a family member or friend but yeah most of the services that we use we have a leaflet for that we will give you as well so if you are interested please do uh, let us know thank you liam um i'm gonna close it there um Sarah I'm not sure if you wanted to come in to say anything um just no but if you, thank you everyone if Liam could stay on for five minutes it'd be good to have a quick quick chat but thank you everyone for coming um I have put the link to the solar center resources in the chat um and we can also add the links to the center below on the webinar thing as well so that was all thank you everybody have a great day Thanks for coming, everyone. Really appreciate it.